Welcome to this uh, lunch today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, our session uh, for th our topic for this particular lunch uh, is regional energy in the global context. Uh, this is the second special luncheon uh, as part of this year's uh, Atlantic Council Energy and Economic Summit. Uh, and it is, uh, we're very pleased that it is hosted today uh, with the generous support of, uh, of any. We're very, very grateful for that support. Uh, any uh, chairman and CEO, Paolo Scaroni, had hoped to be with us here. An urgent meeting was called in London, or sorry, in Rome, that made it impossible for him to be with us. But representing uh, any is, uh, and I would, who I will introduce, Leonardo Bellotti, a vice president at any since uh, this past July, uh, previously served at the United Nations. Uh, a lawyer who has taught international uh, and European Union law. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming our host today, Leonardo Bellotti of ENI. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And let me thank you, the Atlantic Council, for the invitation here in Istanbul, which is since ever for centuries and perhaps since ever a bridge between East and West and a crossroad of political and energy interest. Well, personally, more than at a crossroad, I feel a little bit between a rock and a hard place, given the presence of Mr. Carlo Pasquale from the Department of State uh, with which in the past we were not exactly on the same page. And uh, Philip Lowe, now Director General for Energy, but uh, Philip uh, has been also Director General for Competition of the European Commission. And, uh, well, a few years ago, European Antitrust has shown a close interest to our activities and behaviors. But this is the past. And now the situation, I hope, is completely changed. And I wait for the next WikiLeaks to provide evidence of it. So that's it. Let me make uh, a couple of remarks, very brief. And uh, you know that we have long argued that Turkey will play a crucial role in European su supply security as a key transport hub. Many pipelines projects perhaps too many, are under evaluation or are going to be built in this region of the world. I don't want to get into any evaluation of which transport project will eventually get built and which will remain on the blackboard. But I know, of course, quite everything about South Stream, which, as you perhaps know, started off as a joint initiative between ENI and Gazprom and now also includes France ADF and Germany Winterschau. So it's becoming a multilateral project. I think that this project has made good progress. We know where the gas will come from, what the transit route will be, and who is going to buy the gas at the other hand. On Wednesday, so 40 hours, eight. Uh, 40 hours ago, the board of South Stream took the decision to proceed with the execution of the offshore section of the pipeline. And on December 7th, we'll mark the start of the pipeline construction and we'll effect the decision taken by the companies involved. We think that the first gas will be ready by end of 2014. We, don't know, we do not know exactly where the other projects stand, but regardless of how, how the situation shakes out in the race for the Southern Corridor, Turkey will play a major role as transit country. You know that Turkey is more and more a key pillar for the security of supply of Europe and this region. I don't know if Turkey will join the European Union as a political member. I know that from an energy point of view, 
Turkey is already a member of the European Union and a quite important one. Security of supply may seem to us an old fashioned word at the moment. Indeed, on a day to day basis, gas providers, including ENI, are focusing on trying to get rid of excess of gas. Some may therefore wonder whether there is still room for the planet pipeline and the market for the additional quantity of gas. Because of the economic crisis, which led to a drop of consumption and the shale gas bonanza, some may argue that security of supply is no longer an issue and should be removed from the agenda of our politicians. And because of the LNG, some may think that we can get rid of our traditional partners, Russia, Algeria, Norway, and Libya, and we have to change our, let's say, long-term contracts. But let me underline the obvious. First, having a lot of gas is per se a good news. It is one of the drivers for a price decrease, or it should be, and it helps European industry in the global competition for market and customers. Second, lot of spot gas is not necessarily a recipe for a secure continent. A freezing winter like the one we had this year is enough to remind us how much such a perception is wrong and how much Europe needs gas to secure the supply of our houses, hospitals, industries, and in the near future, believe me, our transports. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to let you know the next portion of the lunch will be lunch. Uh, we will invite our other participants uh, up to the stage after the main course has been served. Please enjoy your meal. It's always a good sign at conferences like this when a lot of people are engrossed in conversation. Uh, and I'm sorry, yet, yet another meal to, uh, to draw that to a close. It's one of my functions here. Um, again, welcome to this uh, luncheon on regional energy in the global context. Uh, we've had a lot of energy discussions at this, uh, at this event uh, over the last day and a half on both uh, specific issues, shale gas, eastern Mediterranean gas, some others and also on more general issues. And I think we had an outstanding briefing for those of you who were able to be part of it this morning 
that Fatih Birol of the International Energy Agency gave uh, on the most recent World Energy Outlook report that I think really helps to frame this discussion uh, today, uh, at, at lunch today, in some very important ways. We want to here kind of draw out a slightly bigger picture, a uh, bigger regional picture. We're, we're very pleased that uh, representative of the European Union, Philip Lowe, is here to uh, talk about that European Union piece. Uh, that we have not addressed uh, quite as much as we might. Relate that uh, a little bit more to U.S. energy policy and to global concerns uh, that the United States uh, and, of course, others uh, have and share, and, and relate uh, both those pieces to the corporate, uh, corporate interests, any in this particular case. There are others represented in this room that I hope will have some good questions to, to factor into the conversation. Uh, conversation here and relate all of that to the presentation that we had uh, this morning. Um, to talk about this, we have, uh, we have uh, excellent uh, and very experienced uh, uh, participants with us uh, at lunch, uh, as I said, to talk about the regional picture, to talk about the global picture, uh, working uh, right to left. Uh, my, uh, my very close friend, Carlos Pascual, uh, currently Special Envoy and Coordinator for International Energy Affairs at the State Department, uh, the, the leader of the State Department's new Energy Bureau, on, or new, new Bureau on Energy Resources, uh, previously served as American Ambassador to Mexico, before that to uh, Ukraine. Uh, we worked very closely together in the second Bush administration on U.S. policy uh, toward the former Soviet Union. Carlos, thank you for being with us. Uh, Philip Lowe is Director General uh, for Energy at the European Commission, a position that he has held since 2010, uh, a long career at the Commission since 1973 uh, that included the, a similar role as Director General for Competition from 2002 uh, to 2010. And then, and then uh, bringing up the corporate side, uh, Leonardo Bellotti, whom I, uh, whom I introduced earlier. I think our plan today I wanted to give an opportunity to both of our, of our uh, news speakers to have an opportunity to kind of lay out some of the issues that they're working on, some of the issues that are important to them, and especially to draw some of the issues that come from, have come from our earlier discussions as they apply to Europe, as they apply to the United States, as they apply to global concerns that are of interest to all of us and Europe and the United States collectively. Uh, and then we'll have a few questions, definitely open it up uh, to the audience for the time that remains. So without any further ado, let me turn it over uh, to Philip Lowe. Well, good afternoon, good afternoon everyone, and um, thank you to the Atlantic Council for an excellent uh, organization and uh, discussion as we've had today and in previous days. I'm speaking first only because Ambassador Pasquale said to me that uh, we're here in Europe and therefore you should speak first. I'd just like to say to all my Turkish friends that I think that many of us in Brussels and elsewhere wish you were already in the political European Union. But in terms of energy, you are in Europe. And uh, because the issues of energy uh, unite everyone who is a neighbor to anyone else. Uh, physical connections, the trade, the investments, inevitable. And there's no other sector where there's such an interplay between technology, between um, technology and public policy and public opinion and markets. Essentially, technology enables um, public policy and public opinion usually hopefully facilitates but sometimes frustrates and uh, finally markets decide and we've got no better um, evidence for that from Fatih Birol's presentation this morning about technology enabling we can see what's been happening um, on the gas market, we're getting a gas-to-gas -gas competition, global competition, but also driven by technology. Um, from the point of view of um, public opinion, you can see how Europe has been changed and transformed, perhaps Japan will see as well by the um, 
the post-Fukushima reaction among public opinion and the lack of acceptance of certain energy mixes. Um, at the same time, you can see how markets react. Uh, in Europe, we are not necessarily uh, uh, blessed with uh, reserves of un unconventional gas, which everyone wants to exploit straight away. And some of our member states have moratoria on it. Um, but uh, what has been the impact of uh, gas in the states on uh, the energy mix in Europe? Frankly, coal, coal is driving the price of electricity in Europe. It's not anything else than that. Coal is the most cost-effective form of um, el electricity generation here in Europe. Uh, what is the result? As we all know, the US managed to reduce its CO2 emissions last year through substitution of coal and oil um, by gas. And what did the EU do last year? It actually increased its CO2 emissions. So there are a number of um, counterintuitive, uh, contradictory results of the short term which uh, make us think about whether we've got the strategy right for the long term. Let me add another thing that, of course, uh, in, any market, in any market for commodities and uh, in any world situation in which governments need to cooperate, the uncertainty as to whether you're actually going to get cooperation or consensus is also a factor. So if in 2008 the European Union believed that there would be a consensus to reduce CO2 emissions throughout the world, the reality today is that um, we're faced with a much more, uh, I would say, competitive environment. And that calls into question um, the basic uh, balance between the three objectives which virtually every country and every region shares in the energy area. Um, first of all, to uh, provide competitive and affordable supplies to businesses and to consumers. Secondly, to ensure um, uh, security of supply. And thirdly, to make sure that the sources of energy are sustainable. Um, now, if indeed in 2008 climate change and sustainability was at the top of the agenda, you can see from the graphs which we've uh, looked at in the last few days and in the World Economic uh, Energy Outlook as well of the IEA, that of course issues of competitiveness and, and uh, security of supply have um, come up the agenda. And they've certainly come up the agenda in the European Union and we will uh, as you will see next year in the beginning of the year, update our strategy on 2008. And whereas you might say that in the, in the past, in this period, for the European Union's member states, um, the objective was to deal with climate change and move to a low carbon economy uh, with the constraint of, Mac, of, of uh, preserving competitiveness and security of supply, the order is slightly changed. I think we can say with some degree of reality now that we are uh, making sure, we should make sure that European consumers get affordable energy, that European business gets competitive supplies, um, that it is secure, those supplies are secure, but nevertheless, we have to move towards a low carbon economy in the longer term. Now, faced with the uncertainties which are evident in a world with so many different factors involved in the energy mix, I say the energy mix not just in terms of choice of technology, but the energy mix of different government uh, views, public opinion, you know, in Austria and in Germany, uh, in Europe, um, some people don't even know how to spell the word nuclear. <laughs> Um, but they certainly don't like it when they see it. Um, in other areas of our, our society, people hate onshore wind like uh, the devil. Others love it. 
Perhaps that diversity of Europe is maybe an advantage in, eventually in terms of security supply. Um, but there are global trends um, which um, the European Union has to think about and um, it has to uh, base a policy of energy on, um, on some things which um, clearly will be sustainable in the, some elements which are sustainable in the long term. And in the minus three minutes which our chair uh, has allotted me, I will just refer to the things which the European Union and its member states will do with no regrets. The first thing is that we've been fighting for a number of decades to get in Europe, and I don't mean just political Europe, but the energy Europe with Norway, with Algeria, with North Africa, with also indeed our big partners like Russia, even if they disagree, an open, competitive, integrated, interconnected market in Europe. This cannot be wrong under any circumstance for a Europe which is uh, increasingly fossil fuel dependent. And um, we've made quite a lot of strides to get there. We've got 17 national markets in electricity coupled. You can't talk about a national market in electricity on the continent of Europe today. Um, the volatility of exports and imports of national, uh, national level is so great that it is impossible to deal with that on a, on a national level. And therefore, we see uh, the need to move very swiftly to the 2014 objective of making sure that market works. And it won't just work because of regulation and network codes. It has to also to work through infrastructure connections. So we're building in the laws which are necessary to facilitate both private and public investment in networks. And just to reassure uh, some of our colleagues here on uh, whether you are this, uh, this neoliberal so-called idea of uh, an open market, um, and I don't believe in neoliberalism myself, I don't come from that tradition, um, I don't think any market works without a degree of regulation in it. Uh, there is nothing in European legislation against long-term contracts. There is something in long-term legislation about monopoly. There's something about rigidity in relation to market pressures. And if we look at the gas sector, um, I'm afraid to say we've got, gratefully and thankfully, a very large amount of liquidity in Europe in the gas market, thanks to global trends. And we want to keep it that way because it keeps a check on indexation. Uh, because indexation in Europe may be dominated by oil. The Chinese are much more intelligent. They want indexation on coal. Um, in a market like that, where there's pressures, this is healthy, and we want to keep it that way. The second thing of no regrets, we still are committed absolutely to diversifying supplies of our key mat raw materials and commodities from outside the European Union. And that means diversification of suppliers as well as routes. We're in favor of more than one supplier per country. Uh, we're in favor of different routes into the European Union. The uh, route into, uh, of the Southern Corridor being one which offers the potential for several countries without naming them uh, who can actually deliver an alternative source of gas into this open, interconnected market in Europe. And that for us is absolutely capital. We have in the last 18 months, two years, tried to stand back from the precise concepts, technical concepts and designs of individual projects and let the market decide which one it wants, whether it's um, east of Turkey, in Turkey, west of Turkey, let the market decide which the things are, which are commercially viable or, or not, and we will support them. Um, and we will also facilitate other initiatives, including indeed South Stream, if that is required and wanted by commercial interests, um, in order to ensure that um, people who want to bring uh, sources of energy into Europe, they can do it in a way which is um, which is um, not hindered by public policy and regulation. 
But our priority is diversification. Diversification of sources of energy, including renewables, by the way, um, and diversification of suppliers, because that is a healthy situation. The third thing I want to say in Fatih Bohol, um, uh, very uh, eloquently underlined that this morning is that in relation to the competitiveness situation of Europe, making better use of energy, whether in terms of energy intensity or in terms of straight um, more efficiency of products, of systems, of buildings, is an absolute key for Europe. Um, and Europe is in the realm of the graph shown where um, the investment in energy efficiency goes way beyond the immediate investment concern. Collectively, it means a huge um, avoidance of costs in generation and in imports. And then let's come on to the issue of climate change. It's very interesting, those countries, those economic units in the world who um, have not uh, believed that it's necessary to sign up to climate change targets. Um, the IEA in its last uh, energy outlook emphasized the costs, the extraordinary costs of, of, of um, not taking into account the rise in temperatures. And um, of course one can hope that individual countries and regions take that into account in their own national policies, even if they don't want any kind of global discipline. And that's totally understandable. But the European Union's position is it has, as a bloc, decided that even in a competitive environment, it is worth pursuing technologies which are low carbon. It has a limited capacity to do that in nuclear because it has an, only 10 countries who are really committed to developing nu nuclear capacity. But it has the potential to develop renewables, and it, is, um, it has invested in it to roll out technologies to make sure that they can reach cost levels which are reasonable, and that for onshore wind and solar voltaic is already looking to be the case by 2015. So the position competitively in Europe looks uh, problematic at the moment. But the, the European Union's long-term strategy is, is, is longer term than the situation today. Coal-fired capacity will be ultimately replaced by, ca by gas as um, uh, regulations enforce closure of uh, polluting coal-fired capacities. The low price of carbon, as well as the low price of coal, is actually discouraging the use of carbon capture and storage as a potential for low carbon uh, economy. And we, we see, therefore, even more emphasis on the need for renewables. But it has to be done in a cost-effective way. It has to be done in a way in which um, we're not backing horses which are never going to win. So the, uh, the, the game, the challenges for Europe are probably as acute as anyone as for any region in the world, but it has a strategy, it has to be realistic about it, but it's not going to give up. Thank you. Ambassador Pasquale. Uh, Ross, thank you very much, and I think, ah, there we go, slides. Um, Ross, thank you for the introduction, thank you for the invitation here and for the Atlantic Council and hosting. Um, at the beginning of this session, I heard Fred Kemp say that I want this to be the Black Sea Energy Forum, not just a conference, and I have to congratulate you on achieving that because everywhere you went throughout this building, there was a buzz of somebody meeting with somebody else, and you really did create that environment of people connecting and using this as a place to create those relationships, and that really is extraordinarily helpful and successful, so congratulations on that. A pleasure to be here with Philip Lowe, and uh, you know, Philip is an um, uh, extremely humble man, um, even though he is now the sixth most influential person in the UK on European Union policy. Um, 
jokingly, there's a magazine that named him that the other day, only behind Kathy Ashton, um, and, but ahead of, uh, of the Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, one of the things that this man has done is he has been fundamental to transforming the nature of the gas market in Europe. And so, just like Turkmenbashi has his own statue in Ashgabat, somewhere there will be an ethereal ga gas statue to you um, erected somewhere, but uh, quite, quite an accomplishment that you've made. And Leonardo Belloli and Ian I, your sponsorship for this session is, is uh, very much appreciated. Certainly you've been a leader in Europe throughout the world on energy policies. Um, we're going to be fascinated to talk about South Stream and see where it goes and uh, there you are going to be a leader again. Um, and we'll see what that leadership actually means in terms of uh, what kind of a project it produces. I, I wanted to touch on a couple of um, themes that have been talked about over the past few days, maybe give you a little bit of sense of where the United States stands on these questions maybe highlight a couple of issues that will play themselves out into the future. And let me start out by um, focusing on this slide. Um, one of the things that we all want to achieve is stability of supply in markets. And what you see played out here on the top line is an estimate of what global production will be through 2035. Above that, you see a small line that says capacity or really reflects spare capacity. The point of that small line, that small delta, is that this is the amount that, that countries can produce in a period of 30 days and sustain for 90 days in the case of an emergency. And the reason that that is so important is that it basically tells the marketplace that if you've got a problem in an inelastic market, that you have a capacity to respond and avoid inelastic demand clashing with inelastic supply and suddenly have an explosion in price. And so in the end, if we want to have stability in the market, you have to be able to ensure that you can fill up that entire supply curve and that you have the ability to maintain spare capacity. What's the spare capacity in the world today? Maybe about two and a half million barrels um, a day. And most of that is in one country, Saudi Arabia. So what happened when we lost one and a half million barrels a day of that in Libya? Well, the price of oil went from the 80s to the about $130 a barrel. And so small changes can have a huge impact. And the point of this is that if we want stability in global markets, this is not a one country solution. You got to fill in this whole curve. And so start from the bottom, working with the Middle East. Go to the Americas and the new position the, the Americas have been in. Go to Russia, go to Brazil as a major new supplier. Go to dozens of other countries that are represented on this curve. My point here is that if we want global stability and markets, we have to be able to work across that entire curve with all of those countries to create the environment for stable supply and growth. And so earlier today when somebody asked Fadi Birol, well as a result of the change in U.S. production profile, does the United States care about the Middle East? Are we going to stay involved? You bet. You bet. Because what is the alternative? If we cannot maintain peace and stability in the Middle East, if we can't maintain stability and peace and safe transit routes, the impacts of that will reverberate globally and have an impact on global prices and global economic growth. And it will affect us in the United States. And so we have to sustain this interest. Do we want to be able to work on this with other countries? Of course we do. But we are not going to be backing off of the global market. We're not going to be backing off of the Middle East or as, as the security of transport lanes because they are fundamental to our own national security. Now, what has the United States been doing? Fatih laid out many of these issues, but let me just touch on a couple of things. We've talked about the importance of energy efficiency, reduction of energy intensity. So look on the chart on my right on consumption, going up for a period of time, but then decreasing and staying flat, a trend that you generally see in the OECD. Part of the equation has to be, how do we keep that consumption curve flat or going in the other direction? 
The other piece that you see below it in the colors are the supply side of the curve. And the phenomenal thing that we have had is the revolution in technology in the United States through ingenuity and, uh, ingenuity and entrepreneurship that has resulted in the increases of production. We've had a lot of attention to the production of shale gas, but shale oil has made a revolution in the U.S. marketplace, with the production increasing about 700,000 barrels a day in the state of North Dakota. And North Dakota has become the number two producer of oil in the United States after Texas. For anybody who follows the oil industry, it's a bit of a shock. It is a massive revolution which has been going on. And what has the impact been? Well, it's what you see in the right where imports of oil have gone from about 60% in the United States to about 41% um, this year and estimated to go down to about 39% next year. Um, Iran, how can you come to this part of the world and not spend at least a couple of moments on Iran, especially after the United States and the EU have been so actively engaged in the imposition of sanctions? It is not something that we want to do. We have done it for a specific purpose, which is to seek Iran's compliance with international demands about transparency on its nuclear program. I think this is a country where one doesn't have to give much of a lecture about what the dangers of a nuclear Iran would actually be. At the beginning of the year, we saw in January that the world market in oil was about almost 89 million barrels a day. What's happened over that period of time? Certainly, um, oil from Iran has been taken off of the market. Because of the cooperation of numerous countries, a complete ban of imports from the European Union, reductions in Japan, South Korea, China, India, um, South Africa, Taiwan, um, Turkey, uh, uh, India, I think I've mentioned, um, there have been about one and a half million barrels of oil a day which have been taken off the market um, as a result of a curbing of Iran's exports to the international community. So why haven't we had a radical increase in prices? And the reason for that, part of that has been the other side of the curve. Increases in the United States. A year ago, a um, year and a half ago, we were in a situation where Libya was going from one and a half million barrels a day to zero. It has gone completely the opposite way around, and since the end of that last year, going from about 700,000 barrels a day back to about 1.5 million barrels a day, and then Iraq. Saudi Arabia has played a critical role at sustaining production at a very high level of about 10 million barrels. But let me spend a couple of minutes here on the Iraq story. At the end of 2011, production in Iraq was about 2.7 million barrels a day. About 2.1 million barrels a day of that was, excuse me, 1.7 million barrels a day of that was, were exports from the south. Exports were at the maximum capacity utilizing all of the infrastructure that existed. There was about um, uh, 400,000 barrels a day coming out of the north, about 600,000 barrels a day in domestic production. Today we have on a consistent basis production of about 3.4 million barrels a day. There have been extraordinary steps that have been taken in the South. Some of it has been um, lashed up together, trying to get the most out of existing infrastructure. There's a new 48-inch pipeline that's been built. The old pipelines have been patched up. An old pump that used to push out oil into Saudi Arabia has reversed and has been rehabilitated. There have been workarounds at the Al Fao terminal um, into the South. There have been new single-point mooring mechanisms that have been put in place. The reason I'm saying this is that for all of the stories that people have heard about the difficulties in Iraq and the problems that have occurred, there has still been a consistent process of moving forward and achieving an infrastructure framework that has allowed Iraq to significantly increase its imports and create a foundation where it can credibly continue to build upon that for additional exports out of the South. The other piece of this that's important to focus on is on the KRG. Um, production there has been, at times, zero because of political disputes between the North and the South. It has increased to almost 200,000 barrels a day again. We think that it could easily be at 200 to 250,000 barrels by the end of the year. 
Um, my friend, Minister of Natural Resources, Ashti Rami, you heard him yesterday, talked about the potential that they have to go to 400,000 barrels a day next year, potentially. The possibilities here, if Erbil and Baghdad can work together on developing Iraq's hydrocarbon resources are absolutely phenomenal. The riches that exist to the south of Turkey, the riches that exist in Iraq in oil and gas are phenomenal. And to the extent to which all parts of Iraq can work together on developing them for the benefit of the Iraqi people and for the benefit of the global marketplace will also have a huge beneficial impact on stability in the region. And so one of the things that we are committed to do as a country, working together with all parts of Iraq, working with our friends here in Turkey, is to look at how we can develop concrete plans, alternatives, projects that will take this theory and that potential and turn it into the kind of output that can really have a definitive impact on stability and energy markets globally. Let me turn to gas. Everybody knows that the United States has been producing a lot of gas. As a result of producing that gas for the first time in the history of the United States, we actually generated more electricity this year using gas than coal. As a result of that, the emissions in the United States over the last few years have gone down about 7%. And I was indeed joking with Phil and telling him at the next climate change negotiations, the United States will be arguing for targets. And as the European Union is using, for more, using more coal, we'll be saying that those targets really need to be left as long-term ambitions. Um, we'll see what in fact happens, but it's the thing that is serious is that one of the reasons that the European Union is using more coal is that we're exporting the coal to the European Union. Um, and then you're paying for it with carbon um, credits that are being generated out of the ETS. It's, it's, it's a strange competitive world <laughs> that we're working in today. But th this map here, what has happened? As a result of gas production in the United States, as a result that the United States has not yet been in a position to complete the necessary review that allows us to make a determination on whether we can export gas, we have had a tremendous amount of gas internally within the country. And as a result of that, the price of gas in the United States right now is about $3.50. In Europe, it's been about $9.70 in the UK, in Spain, $10.50, in Belgium, around the same rate. You can see that um, in South Asia, it's been about $11 in East Asia. It's come down recently. It was up higher at about $15. Um, will this map stay the same? And here's one piece that I find fascinating. If you look at this chart, just, um, which represents global gas trade, um, yes, trade in pipeline gas is increasing, but faster than that has been trade in LNG. And as a result of that, more and more gas is being exchanged around the world and having an impact on prices. So what's a practical example of that? Let me turn to the European sphere. The red dots that you see there are existing LNG terminals in Europe. The red lines are, are are exporters that are sending LNG into Europe. The green lines are pipeline gas. About a decade ago, the amount of LNG that was imported and used in Europe was, I think, somewhere on the order of 30 billion cubic meters. Last year, it was about 90 out of a market of on the scale of 500 billion cubic meters. The amount of gas that Russia is sending in by pipeline has been somewhere between 120 and 140 billion cubic meters. If some of you have been following the Southern Corridor arguments and the political issues that have risen with Russia over the Southern Corridor over what will be in the first phase 16 billion cubic meters, wow, what a phenomenon. 60 billion cubic meters of an increase in LNG imports into Europe which have fundamentally changed the profile of competition for gas with Europe combined with what the European Commission has been doing in changing the regulatory requirements, changing the destination clauses on contracts, building interconnectors that allow gas to be sold across countries for pipelines to be reversed. And so what has occurred as a result of this? 
18 out of the 20 major Western European utilities have in the past two years renegotiated their contracts with Gazprom to lower their price and, ex and, ex and extend the financing terms. For those of you who have followed working, followed the Soviet, or the former Soviet Union, what has happened in Russia, have, have thought about Gazprom and what it represented to Russia as this geopolitical monolith. This is stunning. It is stunning if we can think of a world where, imagine this now, with the changes in EU regulatory policy, that Ukraine can import LNG taken at the coast at an LNG terminal in France and that could be swapped with, French, with purchases by France of Russian gas that could be left off in Ukraine and traded between the two. That is a radical difference in the way that this market works. And so when Phil talks about the importance of interconnected and transparent, this is a fundamental change in the way the European gas market is going to work. It's still at a nation stage. Not every country has benefited. But if you ask the question today, is Europe more energy secure than it was 10 years ago? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let me close with this. And I close with it because of the focus on Turkey. And what we have laid out here is the Southern Corridor project, starting with the pipeline, the South Caucasus pipeline, moving from Azerbaijan to Georgia to Turkey the um, Trans-Adriatic, uh, the Trans-Anatolian um, uh, um, pipeline uh, through Turkey, and then connecting into one of two options that will play itself out into Western Europe. Here's a drama that's going to unfold. I saw Dan Jurgen the other day, and I said, Dan, you know, we're setting this up. You've got another book that's, that's coming here on what's going to happen in, in the European sphere. So, we had a final investment decision that Leonardo told us about that was announced on South Stream just the other day. We'll see how much that results in actual production, what the timelines are on that. It's an expensive project. It's a technically challenging project. Obviously, with the ENI right in the middle of it, we have complete technical capacity to assure that it's accomplished. But this is a phenomenally big project looking at a market that has already been compressed that already has adequate pipeline capacity to supply it, where LNG competition is increasing, where supplies out of Algeria and Libya have already increased. And so how is South Stream going to play into this kind of environment? We have on top of that an antitrust case on Gazprom. How will that play out? Um, we have on top of that gas supplies out of the eastern Mediterranean, which are going to come into the market. Norway has had its largest gas find since 1942. There is the possibility of a whole other, sorts, other sources of gas coming onto international markets, whether the United States will come onto that market. Huge supplies coming out of Australia, great finds out of Mozambique. And so what is this world going to look like? And what about when we add the gas supplies that could potentially come out of Iraq if we can begin to work together in a way that creates greater political stability and greater capacity to use those supplies for electricity generation in Iraq so that they feel that they can actually export that out. Well, where is that going to play itself out? Where is this drama going to play itself out? Right here. Right here in Turkey. Because all of those pieces are meeting at, that, at this very point where the impact of South Stream, the Eastern Mediterranean, Iraq, um, Russian gas, even Turkmenistan are going to have an impact on what the future of gas markets and what competitive looks like, competitiveness looks like in this country and what kind of a framework it creates for the future. And I think if there's one lesson that we have learned over the past 10 years is that when you have competitive markets, when you have the ability to trade, when you have the ability to maintain transparency in those markets, then all of the players are better off. And so if there's one lesson that we're going to be committed to is to continue to work with all of the actors in the region to try to ensure that that kind of competitive, transparent, and interconnected environment, as Phil laid out, is one we can achieve. Thanks very much. Carlos, thank you very much for that outstanding review 
uh, of a number of important trends and a number of important issues. I want to pick up a couple of those issues with a couple of questions to our other two uh, participants. Um, this is a session to open it up to members of the audience. Uh, so as we're answering the first question, uh, please try to catch my eye and uh, we will uh, give, uh, give our guests plenty of opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, pose some questions. Um, uh, Carlos has talked, um, the last portion of his remarks talked about Russia, talked about South Stream, talked about issues related to uh, Russia's role in the European energy market. And I wonder, I, I think it would be helpful to, uh, uh, Philip, you didn't dwell particularly on Russia in your opening remarks, if you want to expand on that, and then ask Leonardo if you'd like to pick up uh, and respond to some of the things that Carlos, uh, points that Carlos made about, about uh, South Stream. Philip, please. <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much. Um, one thing which my Russian counterparts um, emphasize every time I meet them, and that's every 10 days, because we're negotiating uh, an agreement on facilitating electricity trade in the Baltics. We're still um, discussing various aspects of uh, um, implementation of EU law in certain countries where Gazprom owns facilities, uh, like unbundling the networks, for example. Um, they always say to us, um, well, you want this single interconnected market in Europe, but it's, it's a pretty complicated market because there are lots of regulators, there are lots of systems operators. Um, can't you make it simpler? And usually they start off by saying, well, um, would you make it simpler by exempting us completely from all the provisions? <laughs> uh, and they know as well as I do, because they smile at me, and, uh, that the answer to that is no, because if you play in any market, you play by the local rules. And our, rule, our rules in Europe have, in our view, some degree of robustness, that is to say, if you're energy dependent, then you have a strong interest in having an open, interconnected, as, as uh, Carlos has said, competitive market. That's the aim. Now, th at the same time, you've got to have security, not just of supply, but of demand. And it's quite legitimate for investors um, in Russia and in other countries to say, well, we can't simply depend on the spot price in Zeebrugge to make investments which would take us for 30 or 40 years. We need some predictability. To which our reply is, fine. Long-term contracts are a feature of any um, competitive market where you need to hedge um, volatility in price by uh, with your with your counterparts and um, that's fine until such time as the exclusivity is over 20 or 30 years and your domination of any one particular market is 100 percent then it's not fine then we have to do something about it i want to make that clear we're not expecting long-term investors to to suffer from the uh, simply having an idea of what the spot price is but there has to be some degree of, of liquidity in the system, some, some test of the market of what is actually agreed in a long-term contract. And I, th I think there's a process of discussion going on there. Um, I think that um, as far as Russian companies are concerned, for example, um, there is no reason to think that the new European legislation and regulatory framework isn't in fact the best they can ever get because it allows uh, importers, for example, of gas into Europe to go not to a national company who will then take its cut to distribute and supply to any particular industrial customer, but directly to the customers. Directly to the customers using any pipeline available. Not the one you've just built, but any pipeline. So, um, I want to see a really positive agenda in talking to uh, Russian administration and Russian companies about the opportunities 
of this market for what are, after all, our most uh, stable partners in delivering coal, gas, oil, and uranium to Europe. The second thing is to say that this, that um, if you're looking strategically at the future of gas in Europe, looking at it simply in terms of electricity generation is not sufficient. You've got to look at the wider, if, you're, if you want to maximize gas, you'd be interested in uh, encouraging the use of uh, gas in commercial vehicles, in, in shipping, in, in home heating. France is heated by electricity, but home heating is a possibility. And um, a far more useful and productive subject for uh, our discussion with Russia, Algeria, and other countries uh, who are gas suppliers is let's develop those new uses together and the market will grow. Just as we will have a dialogue with the North African countries and those in the Eastern Mediterranean about the export of electricity based upon stable renewable supplies. That is going to come and that's in the interests of Europe and in the interests of its neighbors. Well, just, just to avoid any kind of misunderstanding, when Philip was looking at me speaking about monopolization and so on, he was looking behind me at a guy who is not here today. Um, I, or I should wait for a, expect for a statement or objection soon, I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, South Stream is a challenging project. It is, indeed. But many, many years ago, uh, a lot of people were skeptical about the Blue Stream as well, uh, crossing the Black Sea, and the, the Blue Stream is there. It's working. It's uh, providing a supply of gas to a lot of people and a lot of companies. So um, we think that from a technological point of view, we, we, can, uh, we can make it. Um, and, uh, yes, uh, as I told you before, now we are plenty of gas. Uh, our main target every day is, is how to get rid of excess of gas we have. But who knows what will happen in the future? And it's much better to have one more pipeline than one less. Gas to gas competition, you get good news and good things for companies, for citizens, and uh, for enterprises. Um, a couple of remarks, uh, one remarks on uh, um, the interesting, uh, uh, you know, map of the world. It's true that now we have uh, the national balancing point and the hurry up in, uh, in the U.S. around uh, 3.5, 3.8. Uh, US dollar per million BTU. Uh, in Europe, we have roughly 10, 11, and the East, uh, well, much, much more between uh, 15 and 18 dollars per million BTU. Well, everybody uh, in the energy sector is wondering if such a situation will stay the same. If we, for how many years, months, and so on, we will have three different regions in, in the world? It's a huge question. Uh, we will go towards, you know, the U.S. Uh, they will stay the same. We will have three, three different um, uh, prices in the world, or we will have uh, a price close to uh, the area or to the Asian. I think no one knows. And uh, gas prices are actually quite unpredictable as the oil price. So, and even for us, you know, for a company, when we have to make a presentation to, for, for, to our board of directors in order to go ahead with a huge project as Mozambique, for example, well, for us it's very, very important to understand what the price will be. Uh, last but not, well, the last remark is Russia is very important. Uh, U.S. shale gas is very important, but I think that one of the key role 
can be played by, by me Mediterranean countries, by Libya, by Algeria, by Egypt. We, uh, we have seen it this year and last year, even in the middle of the Arab upstream. They are reliable partners, very, very important for Europe and especially for, for the Southern Europe, Italy, and so on. Do you want to add anything? No. Um, we have a little less than 10 minutes left, uh, so this is an opportunity for any in our audience to pose a question. Uh, we have one back in the back. Please, if you would uh, please identify yourself and uh, indicate to whom your question is directed. And hopefully the microphone will work. There it goes. Yes, working. Uh, Amit Mo from Echo Energy Israel. Uh, uh, to Mr. Ambassador Pasquale, uh, um, Ambassador uh, Morningstar and others invested uh, almost 20 years in promoting the flow of gas from the Caspian region uh, via Turkey to Europe and, uh, and hopefully, yes, okay. Ambassador Morgan, Morningstar and others, US government invested almost 20 years in promoting the flow of gas from uh, the Caspian region, Azerbaijan via uh, Turkey to Europe. Uh, we are almost there. The question, what are the means, what are the tools that uh, your, the U.S. disposal, indeed to promote uh, long-term energy projects? If you can relate also specifically to the dispute between Turkey and Cyprus vis-a-vis -vis the development of the natural gas resources. And uh, to Mr. Lowe, um, you just hinted vis-a-vis -vis the uh, desert tech of the development of uh, North Africa, Middle East uh, renewable energy sources, uh, specifically uh, solar energy, to be utilized in Europe. Uh, is it a dream or an actual project? Thank you. Um, I, I think I heard the question. I'm not completely sure, so I'll answer what I think. Um, and, uh, um, and hopefully that will say something interesting, even if it doesn't completely answer your question. Um, I did hear you mention Ambassador Morningstar. And uh, in fact, I'm very pleased that Dick um, Morningstar is here. Uh, my good friend, and you, if you ask the question, what is it, one of the things that is absolutely critical in helping effective energy projects move forward and work? Well, Dick is a good answer to that. Um, and so uh, we've, we've thought that he is so important to this equation that we asked him to go to Baku and put himself at the very source of the Shah Deniz project and work together with our Zeri friends and partners, as well as with the companies to actually do whatever we can to be reinforcing of the viability of that project because of the importance that we see as well as all the other reasons that Azerbaijan is important as a friend for stability in the region. Um, I think one of the things that we have seen throughout the world is that creating an environment where companies can come in, invest, have an assurance of return on their investment, and have some sense of the security of contracts is absolutely fundamental and key. And, you know, there are plenty enough com companies around here. Uh, Leonardo is going to say the same thing. Paula's over here and see her nodding her head. This isn't rocket science. This isn't anything that's particularly new, but it's fairly basic. When, com when companies understand that there is a resource and have the environment in which they can invest the resources that are necessary to explore, test, develop it, and then have the markets develop to be able to sell it, and have a sense of security of access to those markets, then the development of energy resources doesn't have to be a, dram a, a dramatic event. And I think that what we increasingly want to be able to see throughout this region, and so let me just take this question back to Iraq, is you know, how can we reduce the trauma? Um, how can we get to an environment where the contractual relationships, the contract terms, the, the legal terms, are sufficiently secure and the transport routes are well established and known so that companies can move forward with those kinds of investments. That's a challenge to move forward with, but I think there's a foundation to work with. Um, earlier this week at the Oil and Money Conference, I had a chance to talk with Deputy Prime Minister Sherestani. Um, and it was interesting because there were press reports saying that he was saying maybe not so positive things about um, his views of certain companies and the, and, and the willingness to create a positive business climate there. But one of the things that he said unequivocally was that Iraq recognized that the terms that they had been offering under contracts in the South 
has not been sufficiently attractive and they need to work on those terms to improve them for existing contracts and to change the contracting relationships for the future. And while there have been issues and tensions obviously between the North and the South and everybody who is in this room who lives in this region works on these issues knows that, what we've also heard from him is that there is an absolute commitment to take the agreement that was signed on September 13th to ensure that money and oil are flowing in the two directions and to be able to reinforce that for the future. And that's a good foundation to work with and that's something that we're very committed to be able to provide a supportive role with our friends both in Erbil and Baghdad to help advance further. Thank you. Philip on solar and EU. Yeah, J just to say one word about the U.S. in, in return that Ambassador Morningstar, among many others, but particularly he himself, has contributed enormously to creating the right, in our view, the right dialogue about the strategic, strategic interests of individual countries in Europe and in Asia and bringing people together to look to, to let, lift their eyes up to the hills and then arrive at solutions which make sense. And often in all our areas, including inside the European Union, there's plenty of looking down and not looking up. The U.S. makes us look up. And the U.S. makes us think long term, and that's already uh, borne its fruits. If we refer to, and I, I'm, I mean that too with respect to Russia as well, uh, if you look at the Ukraine, um, if, if there was a chance of the Russian companies, the Ukrainian government, and European and U.S. investors being able to agree on the legislation around the Ukraine's transit system, and it was based on principles of transparency and competitiveness, everyone will benefit, as Carlos said, everyone will benefit from it. And that's the kind of stability which... Um, the U.S. gives to the political relationships. I have to say that the European Union got its peace prize for its um, Nobel Peace Prize for its contribution to peace in Europe. I think we should a actually got it for our relentless pursuit of the rule of law. Uh, maybe sometimes the relentless pursuit of rules, but <laughs> but 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 in fact, you know, rolling out a set of regulations and legislation and courts across 27 member states of the European Union, some of them who have been in quite different regimes until only a very short time ago, is a big task. And it's the combination of um, uh, US political strategic leadership and the EU's capacity to mobilize this system to, to work, which will make sense. And it will make sense too for, this, for development of solar energy from North Africa, We've already got legislation in place to encourage um, com companies, uh, countries, sorry, to to cooperate with external suppliers to bring in um, electricity f from outside the European Union uh, um, under their renewables targets. The the very, I agree with you implicitly in your implicit remark. It's not going fast enough. We look as if we're going to have a pilot project with between France and Morocco. It depends very much on the, the, the cooperation of our Spanish colleagues because otherwise if there's no, there's no adequate physical capacity, particularly in the south of Spain for transmission, we'd have a problem. But we do see that um, uh, both between Italy uh, and its immediate neighbors on the North African side and ultimately speaking in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, we can see both gas and electricity uh, production expanded and exports to the main hubs of the European Union. Uh, I think we have time for one more. There was a question, I'm sorry, Barton, but there was a question back in the back from the very beginning. Please. I can try.
Thank you. Uh, John Dysart with the FT. Uh, a question for Mr. Bellotti. In, uh, John Dysart with the Financial Times. A uh, question for Mr. Bellotti. You made an interesting reference to how long this uh, price gap or arbitrage between the U.S. and much of the, you know, Europe and Asia can persist. In your internal modeling uh, within ENI, do you find that it's more likely that the U.S. price rises more than the uh, rest of the world price falls? Or where do you find the economics tend to shake out in your uh, Monte Carlo simulations or whatever you use? Uh, let's hold that price question and maybe quickly take uh, a couple of others. Barchin Yinach here. Um, if we could bring the microphone to this table. I'll, I'll come back to you. Is this mic on? Yes, thanks. Jennifer Coolidge, Caspian and Gulf Consultants. My question is also for Mr. Bellotti of, of ENI. The question is specific to South Stream. Uh, I see the pipeline as a Ukraine bypass. Could you please comment on exactly which fields that do not already feed gas to the EU through Ukraine will serve the South Stream pipeline, given the EU objectives for diversification of supply source and supply route? And then second, could you comment on how pricing for gas through South Stream will be more competitive in Europe, given the high capital outlay costs of the project? Thank you. So price, price, and, and where is the gas coming from? And then a last from Barchin. News. Um, interestingly, Mr. Love and Mr. Belodi talked about Turkey being in the EU in the energy sector. This is very interesting because, you know, at a time when Turkey cannot even open chapters on the energy, we don't really see Turkey inside the EU as far as energy is concerned. Plus, due to the Cyprus problem, we very know that in times of crisis, EU tend to side with its members rather than non-members. But the direct question would be to Mr. Belodi. Um, the Turkish government has sort of said that it might stop the operations of the companies that take part in the Cyprus drilling, and my understanding is that any is one of them, so I was wondering what would be your reaction to that, and Mr. Love is, of course, welcome to comment as well. Thank you. Leonardo, you get to bad cleanup. Uh, three, three good questions, I think. Well, um, on, on the FT uh, question, let's say, well, you know, when we have tried to guess the oil prices, we have always been wrong, always. We have never been able to, let's say, to guess this. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid that it worked for the, the same way for the gas prices. We, don't, we do not exactly know. What we know is that more or less now, you know, roughly the, uh, let's say, spot price counts in Europe for between 20 and 30 percent, okay? Um, closer to 20 than to 30 percent. So we think that uh, it's quite unlikely that we will get a price at the, as at the Harry Hub, so, so low, and quite unlikely that we will go towards uh, the Asian price. So it will stay in the middle, and our model works in this way. Uh, on uh, on South Stream, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, of course, we will. It's up to the Gazprom and and to Russian to to to, to supply uh, South Stream with with the gas and to identify the field. It would be from Yamal Peninsula, I guess. So I do not exactly know from which field. Uh, South Stream we will supply to. Um, on the gas price, you know, uh, we, will use, uh, we will use the same model as Blue Stream, so the net back price. So it will be up to the supplier to make a price which at the beginning of the pipeline, which make the price at the end competitive at the European market. So exactly the same model as we use in the Blue Stream and net back model. Uh, on Cyprus, uh, well, we, we, I was waiting for such a question. 
course, you know. Well, let me let me tell you. Well, um, you know, we are a corporation, uh, okay? Uh, we are a corporation, and we always say that um, borders and disputes are borders are you know jurisdiction are state jurisdictions. As we, have, we cannot do anything about it. We do follow, of course, you know, the borders of the state in which we are incorporated and the state uh, which has jurisdiction on us. So we do follow the European Union borders. Uh, we think that our position is legitimate according to the European Union law. And um, we, of course, I heard what uh, Minister Yildiz has told. Um, I should say that the reaction of uh, Turkey is a quite mild reaction, you know, they, they, they just issue, uh, raise an issue, uh, and, uh, well, we are in touch with our, um, with our uh, Italian government and uh, the, European, uh, the, European, and the European Union in order to, to get this situation clarified. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Before I draw this session to a conclusion, let me, and thank our guests, let me just do a, a tiny bit of housekeeping. In our ever-evolving schedule, uh, there, there is on the agenda, there are on the agenda two sessions that follow this. One of those has been canceled. Uh, the session on the human face of energy, unfortunately, is not going to take place. Minister Ildiz was called to a last-minute meeting uh, today by, uh, by the Prime Minister, and so we've had to scrub that. The, the, the sole remaining session, therefore, that begins at 3.45, so in about 15 minutes, looking forward, building new opportunities in a dynamic region. The overall uh, title of this conference, Building New Opportunities in a Dynamic Region, this aims to kind of pull together some of the, the economic energy and frankly also political themes that we've talked about. Uh, it features a Turkish finance minister, Mehmet Shimshek, who's been a big supporter uh, of this event in the past, and it also this year, a very interesting speaker, Delian Dobrev, the, fi the finance or economic and energy minister uh, of Bulgaria, and Ibrahim Turan, the uh, president of the Istanbul Stock Exchange, plus the Atlantic and Atlantic Council board member, Robert Abernathy, as uh, as moderator. Uh, as I re to repeat, starts at about 15 minutes in one of the adjacent rooms here. Um, dinner tonight is, uh, is off-site from this venue. Uh, we're at the Chiron Palace. Buses will begin leaving from here for those who are staying at the hotel at 6 o'clock. Reception is 6.30 to 7.30. Dinner is at 8 o'clock. Our featured speakers tonight, uh, a moderated discussion that Fred Kemp will have with former U.S. National Security Advisor Bignet Brzezinski and former National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley uh, to, to, to sort of draw together a lot of the themes that are here and look, look ahead in a bigger, more strategic way at the future. Um, thank you, panelists, for an outstanding and very interesting discussion. Please join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>